Thank you for joining our New Life Bible study entitled The Good News Doctor, taught by Pastor Alan Brooks. The New Testament book of Luke examines in detail the life and ministry of Jesus and is written with the warmth and compassion of a good old-fashioned family doctor. Prepare your hearts and minds for what God has for you personally as Pastor Alan leads us in our study. Have you ever had that experience where you were there at a very historic moment in time? You know, like when the Cubs won the World Series. Historic, right? Well, you've been at one of those moments already today. Did you catch that? The all-girl band at New Life Church. I was there. I was there. No, they, they did absolutely awesome. I had heard about it being planned earlier this week, partly because a large number of our men are up in Glorietta, actually probably finishing up about now from our men's retreat up there. I was up there until yesterday evening, and uh, wow, I could see that God was really working in a number of their lives. So if they don't come back on fire, you send them to me, and I'll light a fire on them if we have to. I, I, I want to be personal with you for a minute and, and share a little bit of my past. Um, it's a sensitive subject. I'll just say that on the front end. Um, but as a kid, quite honestly, I wasn't the smartest kid in school. Um, I know that comes as a shock to so many of you. Um, but no, sincerely. In fact, I, I grew up in the age in elementary school, at least, and I'm dating myself, I know, with this, but I often came home with a report card that had a lot of U's on it. Any of you old enough to remember what the U stood for? unsatisfactory. Um, I had a lot of them, and two of my big common ones were does not play well with others, and uh, handwriting. Did not do very well at that. I was actually at the men's retreat yesterday, and they had uh, a big race up there, one of the mountain bike races, and they had uh, things taped off, and we were joking about, you know, we should hurdle over that. And I'd shared that as a kid one time, I was on a track club, and uh, the coach came to me and asked me to run high hurdles. Um, never did that before, but I've got to tell you, I won a ribbon for fifth place in that race. Isn't that amazing? Now, there were only five guys in the race, and I knocked over almost all of the hurdles. So not only was I not the smartest kid in school, I wasn't the most talented athlete either. And maybe some of you can identify with that. I mean, I often look to people that were smarter or more gifted and more talented than I was. And, you know, to be honest, I, I, I wanted what they had. Um, I was the best looking, though, so that helped. But No, you can obviously tell I was not that either. But I, when I was about 9, 10 years old, I entered a race. I had taken up a new sport. You know, you try different things to try to find your niche. And the sport that I was in was called Trials. And uh, it's a motorcycle riding event where the objective is to go over obstacles and through flags, you know, various places without putting your feet down or especially without falling down. And uh, that too, I won a trophy in. And it was a trophy that in a lot of ways kind of set the tone for the rest of my life. The trophy on the plaque front of it said, tried the hardest, which can also tell you that I came in last in that particular event. But it did teach me something. It taught me that I could try hard, that maybe I wasn't the smartest, maybe I wasn't the most talented or gifted person, but I could try hard and work hard with what I did have. And it, like I said, started to set a tone for my life. I started to do better in school. I started to do better in athletics. And even when I went into business later in life, I did better, not because I was so talented, not because I was so smart, but because I was willing to work hard. I was willing to take the gifts that I had and use them to produce the success that I was looking for. But that trophy also taught me, taught me another very harsh lesson of life that I'm going to share with you in a, in a bit. But for the time being, I want you to be thinking about this. Every one of you has been gifted by God. Some of you more so than others, but every person in this room, every person listening to this right now has been gifted in some way. How is it that you're using those gifts? Are you using those gifts even in the way that God intended for you to use them? 
What we're going to see in our passage today is a parable about that very idea that Jesus gives. If you haven't done so already, I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to continue our study there. We're down in verse 11. As they heard these things, he, speaking of Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But the citizens, his citizens, hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Let's stop right there for a minute. The last couple of weeks in our study, we've been in a town called Jericho. And I've shared with you, if you've been any part of that study, that in the first century there were two Jerichos. One was the Jericho that had become ruins when Joshua and his troops marched around and the walls fell down. But there was a newer Jericho. But within these two cities, we've seen some amazing, miraculous things happen. The first thing we saw was the blind man received his sight. Do you remember all that he did to receive his sight? He called on the name of Jesus, the son of David. Have mercy on me, he said. And when Jesus came to him, he says, what would you have me do? And he said, I would like to regain, recover my sight. And immediately he did. In the new Jericho, there was another man, a very rich man. What in the first century they might have considered a bad man because he worked for the Romans, the oppressors of the Jewish people. And he collected taxes from the fellow Jewish brethren of his and gave it to the Romans, often cheating them of the money that was entitled to them. His name is Zacchaeus. He too, though, had an encounter with Jesus that changed the course and the path of his life, as you might recall. And he came to a saving faith in Jesus. When we come to this parable, it is my belief that this parable is told in that same area around Jericho. This is before they go up the hill into Jerusalem. And that's what we see taking place right here. Some of you might know this and some of you uh, might not, but the word parable in the original language means to throw alongside. In other words, it's a metaphorical story that's thrown alongside daily lives of people to teach them a very important truth. And that's what we're looking at here a story that Jesus gives to teach them, and I believe us, a very important truth. Every parable that we look at in Scripture has a plot. It has players within that plot. And part of the objective that we have is to come to an understanding of what we're supposed to know about that. Who are those players? Could one of those players be you? Could they be me? Could the plot have to do with your life or with my life? As I hope you'll see today, that's very much the case. The first person that we run across, the scripture that I read from, the English Standard, refers to him as a nobleman. Now, I'm fascinated sometimes with the original language, and I'll just share this with you. But nobleman in the Greek is anthropos tes egenis. Literally, it means a certain well-born man. Hold that thought, we're going to come back to it. But that's who this nobleman is. And we see that he is going to go off to a far country. Now, we're used to going across the world in our time, aren't we? I mean, you can jump on an airplane and be on the other side of the globe in 10 or 12 hours. But not so in the days of old. They would travel by foot or in some case by camel or horseback. But the implication of this story is the idea that he's going to a far country is the idea for us that it's going to take quite a while before he does what? This nobleman has promised that he's going to return. It's a very important part of our plot that this nobleman is going to return. Before he leaves, however, he gathers ten of his servants. 
10 of the people that he believes are faithful and loyal to him. And what he does is he distributes a mina, a measure of money, to each one of them. A mina really wasn't that much money. It was only about 100 days wages. But he distributed it equally among the 10 men. Notice that all 10 of them are given an assignment. I don't know what your translation says, but the one that I read from says that they are to go and conduct business, engage in business. What do you think the nobleman intends by that? That they would take the resources that they've been given and put it to work, right? That's his intention. We're also told about another crowd different from the servants. They're the citizens. This word in the first century meant people that were of nobility within their community. They had status within their community. They weren't just your ordinary sharecroppers or whatever. They were people that had status in the community. That's who these citizens are. What does it tell us about the citizens relative to the nobleman? Do they want him to reign over them? No way. They're very much opposed to the idea that this guy, would reign over them. Now, what's unique about this parable compared with all the other parables that Jesus tells is it actually resembles history. See, as it turns out, when King Herod died, and for those of you that don't have this context, this is a king that lived prior to Jesus coming. This is the king when he heard that a king had been born in Bethlehem, sent troops to the area in Bethlehem, and did what? slaughtered every kid under the age of two years old. And it's part of our Christmas story every year. That's King Herod. He died not long after that event. And when he died, he divided up his kingdom between three of his sons. One of his sons, Archelaus, was given the area of Judea, what we now know as Israel. He was the one who was supposed to rule and reign over that. He is the one who built the winter palace there in Jericho that we've talked about here recently. Are you tracking with me? Because this kingdom had to be ratified by the Romans, this nobleman, Archelaus, went to Rome to meet with the emperor at that time because he wanted the emperor to ratify that he was in fact entitled to rule and reign over the area of Judea. But the Jewish people, they didn't want none of that. So they took 50 of their most distinguished citizens and sent them as a delegation to go tell the emperor, no, 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 not this guy, okay? He's even worse than his father was. And so it's kind of interesting if you think about it. Although this had happened a number of years before Jesus tells this parable, there's some things that are ringing in the ears of the people who are hearing it, right? They're kind of seeing some associations with some things that they know has already happened in their world. Follow with me down to verse 15. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. So here we see that the king returns. And even in our historical story, that was true as well. Archelaus came back and did actually rule over that area. But this king in our story calls for what they sometimes call a sit rep in business or in the military. He wants a situation report from his servants. What does he want to report on? How they've used the money that he's entrusted to them that long time before when he left. He wants to know how they did. It clues you into something important. This nobleman was giving a test 
to these servants, was he not? He wanted to see whether they could be trusted once he came back to his land to help run his kingdom when he got there. Are you following the story? We're only told about how three of them used that resource. It says one grew, the one mina that he was given, to ten minas, that it multiplied ten times. Another servant, it says, multiplied it five times from its original amount. We see that the king, when he returns, is happy with what they've done. Would you agree? In fact, with the first servant, at least, he says, well done, good servant. And he gives the first guy who multiplied to ten, ten cities that he would rule over. In other words, his responsibility with a small amount of money proved that he could be trusted with great authority in his kingdom. Likewise with the one who had five. And so the story goes. I was thinking about this this week and I wondered if they couldn't have replied a little bit like we saw a few weeks back in Luke where we saw this written. It says, when you've done everything expected of you, be matter of fact. Say, the work's done. What we were told to do, we did. Wouldn't it have been great to be one of those two servants and said, hey, you told us what we were supposed to do. We did the best we could, and here's what the results were. Notice the king also moves on to a third servant. In verse 20, it says, Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him. Give it to the one who has ten minas. And they, the servants around, said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. The king says, I tell you, that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken from him. But as for those enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Wow. What a contrast between two that are very responsible with what they've been entrusted with and another who is irresponsible. Don't you wonder why? Why was that third servant irresponsible? Was <laughs> he just lazy? Maybe. Is it because he was just too busy building his own kingdom that he didn't have any time to do the business that the master had for him? It also could be possible that he did not even really believe that the master would someday return. Ah, he'll probably get killed in that foreign land. We'll never see him again. The text doesn't tell us, but I think it helps frame for us a little bit of motivation sometimes that we have. I also find it curious that he, he gives the mina in a handkerchief. These are not unlike today. You see motorcycle riders, they'll put them over their face when they're riding to keep the dust out. That was true in the first century as well. So he takes this old handkerchief, right? Maybe he blew his nose in it, doesn't say, right? But then he gives the master back his mina. The master's immediately happy with him, no, not at all. I think it's fair to say the master, the king, is angry with him. He calls him wicked. The word could also be translated evil. It's also used of Satan and the devil, a description of them as well. That's what the master says to him. Notice immediately what the servant has done, though. Did you catch that? He's doing one of the oldest dance moves there are out there. I'm going to see if I can get this right because the young people corrected me at the first service. He's not doing the gung ham. Am I saying that? Gung nam? 
Gangnam. Okay, it's not that dance move, to be clear. Now, there are some others that I can say a little bit better. He's not doing the moonwalk like Mike, Michael Jackson, right? He's not doing the slide. He's not doing the hokey pokey because that's not what it's all about. <laughs> what he is doing, though, is a very famous dance move that was popularized by a couple named Adam and Eve. They call it the blame shift. Do you remember that one? See, when God came and wanted to know why they ate the fruit, oh, it, it was the serpent, that, that, that's why. Not, not me, right? it was the, the serpent. Adam's response was even worse. He said, well, God, it's, it's the woman you gave him. Not only is he blaming his wife, but he's blaming the God who gave him his wife. Blame shifting goes around all the time. My wife shared with me this week that she was in traffic headed to work and uh, was in a lane that could either go straight or turn left. To her right, in a lane that was intended only to go straight, that person jumped the light and cut right in front of her so she had to slam on her brakes and like a good New Yorker that she is, she honked her horn, right? That person responded by honking their horn and gestures went on, I think, the other part. You didn't make any gestures. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> But, but, but the irony is, I told her, we live in a world, and by the way, this is not new, where my bad behavior is your fault. I don't have to own that. That's your fault. And that's exactly what this servant is doing. He's blaming the king for who he is and how he is. It's his fault that I didn't do anything with what you gave me. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing that somebody who's been entrusted with this responsibility would then turn around and blame it on the other. It's interesting, too, that he instructs the other servants to take the one mina out of the handkerchief and give it to the one who has how many already? Ten. Now, we live in a world that's all about, I would say, socialism, uh, entitlement, a lot of people think that when we get to heaven, everything's going to be all equal. We'll all have the same size house. We'll all be the same height. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But we think that somehow our rewards are all going to be the same when we get to heaven. Not according to what the Bible says. In fact, this particular passage indicates something that Scripture is replete about. Jesus talks about this in every single one of the gospel accounts. To whom... Much is given, much is expected. To whom takes a little in responsibility, much will be given. To those who are irresponsible, even what they have will be taken from them and given to others. God's economy is not socialism. God has great expectations for his servants, as did this king. It's also curious about those citizens the citizens who were enemies of the king. Now, I don't know if this were true in the original story of history, whether those citizens were killed, but I would not be surprised if that were true. That, in fact, when that delegation got back and King Archelaus came back, that he, in fact, killed every one of those Jewish men that was in that de delegation. Would not be surprised. But for sure, what we see in our parable is that they are to be punished because they have rejected the reign of the king. Let's break the parable's meaning down a little bit. One of the other uniquenesses of this parable is it's very clear up front about what its purpose is. It tells you up front that Jesus was nearing Jerusalem. And if you've been following along with this, you recognize that there's a larger and larger crowd that has started to follow along with him. And the passage here tells us that they're all thinking what's about to happen. They're thinking that Jesus is going to go up the hill and go up there and take the throne of David and establish his kingdom right then and there. So Jesus has to tell them a parable because he's got to correct their thinking about that. Because as you and I hopefully know, that's not what took place at that point. That's still yet future when he'll establish his kingdom and take the throne. But he gives this parable just so that they can have a better sense about what's going to happen. One of the core truths I want you to take away with yourself today is that Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom. 
Amen. And he's coming back whether people like it or not. The servants are those who right now have put their faith and trust in the name of Jesus Christ. The citizens that we see in the parable are very clearly the unbelievers of this world. The rejectors. The people even now that says, Jesus is not my king. He's not going to tell me how I'm supposed to live my life. No way, no how. And we see what their lot is going to be when he takes his throne. Yeah, super hot. <laughs> I hope you're not among that crowd. I'm absolutely amazed sometimes how God is continually gracious and merciful upon even the unbelievers. Here in the last week or so, I don't know how many of you saw this. I saw the article referenced in Newsweek, but Nature Magazine, which is a big, big science periodical, published an article about some of the research at CERN. This is that big collider that they have in Geneva, Switzerland. Let me read to you part of what was said in this article just recently. The universe as we know it should not exist. That's what the scientists have said. In fact, they said, after performing the most precise experiments ever on antiprotons, researchers have discovered a symmetry in nature they say just should not be possible. As they say, after whatever created the universe, what some call the Big Bang, there's particles and antiparticles. They know that when they meet each other, they annihilate each other. And so they've longed to believe that there was at least a smaller number of one than the other, which allowed for all of this to take place. But all their experimentation is saying that's not true. They can find nothing that demonstrates that there was ever a point when they were unequal. In fact, one of the researchers, a man from Japan's Riken Institute, says this. He says, all of our observations find a complete symmetry between matter and antimatter, which is why the universe should not exist, he said. An asymmetry must exist somewhere, but we simply do not understand where the difference is. What is the source of the symmetry break, he asks. May I help you with the answer to that question, if you don't know? It's God. See, God continues to show science even. You're deceiving yourselves. What's right in front of your eyes is that I created all of this. Even to the last bell before Jesus returns, he's giving them an opportunity to turn towards him. If you're one of those citizens today hearing this, if you're an enemy of God, you're someone who hasn't put your faith and trust in him, today could be a day that you should change that. We don't know how much time we have left. Why would you even take a chance? All you've got to do is believe. Put your faith, put your trust in the unseen. Put your faith, put your trust in Jesus, the name above all names, the Son of God, who continually demonstrates to us that he desires to spend eternity with you. It's only you that are wanting something different for your life. For the last several months, I've been trying to draw your attention to something that I and many others believe, and that is that although Jesus was preparing his first century followers that it was going to be a long time, I believe we are nearing the end of that long time, that the return of that actual king is probably much nearer than even you and I imagine. Paul writes about this even in the first century to the church at Thessalonica, and here's what he says. Concerning how and when all this will happen, brothers and sisters, notice what he says. We don't really need to write you. Now you've got to ask, why does he say that? For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. And he says, when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. Did you catch that? You won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are children of the light and of the day. 
We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert, be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But those who live in the light, be clear-headed, protected by the armor and faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Is that you today? Are you walking through this life with the confidence of your salvation, knowing that everything is right between you and our God? And then notice what it says, for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Who's he going to pour out his anger on? Those enemies of God, those citizens. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So even those who have already passed into the grave, who knew and believed in the name of Jesus, when he comes, scripture says, they will rise to meet him in the air, as will we. And then notice what he says, encourage each other, build each other up, just as you are already doing. In other words, we should be on ready, looking up, looking for the blessed hope that we're told to be looking for, the return of our king. Amen? I'm not going to belabor this, but in the last few months, I've tried to point your attention to so many of the signs that are out there, signs in Israel. All of Israel being regathered into the land. And how all these numbers line up right around this time frame right now in 2017. But it's not just that. There are also signs that scripture tells us there will be in the sun, the moon, and the stars. And again, not to belabor this, we've talked about it in the last few weeks. We have pointed to the fact that there's several things that scripture said would happen, which indeed have happened. And things are continuing to happen. In fact, here just recently, somebody shared with me something else that's very instructive on this, and it has to do with the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus 12, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a a woman conceives, if a man did, that'd be weird, if a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean how many days? So you got the first period of time. At the end of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin, the baby, shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. Some are looking at that great sign in the sky that undoubtedly happened right around September 23rd and using that date as a baseline, seven days takes us to the 30th and then beyond that takes us to November 2nd or 3rd, which is, if you don't know, this week. Now, again, as I've tried to say in this study many times, what you do with that information is between you and your Lord. But I am trying to wake you up. This is not a time to be slumbering. This is a time to recognize that the day of our Lord returning is probably nearer than we think. What's curious about November 3rd is what it's called on the Jewish calendar, Vaver, which literally means he appeared. Fascinating, isn't it? What does it mean? I guess we'll see next week. But here's another truth in preparation for that. In his absence, Jesus has left work for his servants to do. Do you get that? Let me say it again. In his absence, Jesus has left work for me to do. Is that right? But not just me, for you too. God has left work for you to do and for me to do in his absence. Do not be deceived by that. Do not play games with it. Don't be that wicked servant. Don't be lazy. It's fascinating because the parable of the minas is actually similar, but yet very different from the parable of, as you might know, parable of the talents that we see in Matthew 25. But one of the similarities that we see in both of those illustrations, both of those parables, is that God has given us work to do. What you ought to be asking yourself, am I fulfilling that work? Am I doing what it is that God has put me here for? Because again, back to the harsh lesson that I learned with my trophy. Do you remember the one that said I tried the hardest? I took that to school when I was in sixth grade. I I took it for what? Does anybody want to take a guess? 
for show and tell, of course, right? I don't know why I want to put myself in such a bad light, but I did. And when I took it, while I was at recess that day, somebody stole it. Never seen it again since. First truffle we had ever won in my life. Stolen. Harsh lesson. The trophies of this life are all going to fade away or get stolen. And they're all going to prove themselves to be unfulfilling. So why are we going after them? Why are you chasing those things? Why do I allow myself at times to chase after the things of this world? Because what God has for us, his trophy, is something that's going to last forever. Ever. Forever. Where do you want to be putting your efforts? Into this world and these things that are all going to pass away or into what God has for us. So he has business for us. I saw a quote this week that I thought was so powerful. It said, God's not in the career building business. Did you know that? As much as you think of your career, he's not in building your career. He's also not in the pleasure building business. He's not in the dream fulfilling business. God is in the kingdom building business. That is the work that he has given us to do. Paul, I think, very clearly states our mission, our work that was assigned to each and every one of us in 2 Corinthians 5. There he says, God has given us the task, the work of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Are we doing that? In your world where you work, are you encouraging people to be reconciled to God, letting them know that Christ died for all their bad behavior. And if they'll just simply believe, he'll separate them from their sin as far as the east is from the west, and he'll remember it no more. I love that he did that for me. Do you love that he did that for you? Why would we not share that message of reconciliation, which is so incredible? What they do with it, that's not on me. That's not on you. Who's that on? It's on them. They just got to decide. But are we doing our part? Which servant are you today? Are you one of the responsible ones or one of the irresponsible ones? Because the last truth that I give you is that when he returns, when Jesus returns, he's going to ask for an accounting of what you've done. Paul again in Corinthians says, for when we must all stand before Christ to be judged, not for our sin, that's already been paid for at the cross. We're all standing before him to receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil that we've done in this earthly body. Not unlike the people with the minus, not unlike the people with the talents. That's what we will all stand before him to be held accountable for. Now, when we do that, is God going to turn a blind eye? Or is he going to handle things just like he did in these two illustrations? Do you think God was lying to us when he told us about the minas and the talents? And how some of those servants were called evil and wicked? Do you think he was just making that stuff up? Why did he tell us then? To warn you. To warn me. To recognize that there is a future in which we will be held accountable to the work that he has given us to do. Do not let this world, do not let false teachers tell you any different. The grace applies to our salvation, but we were saved to do good works. Do not be deceived. God has expectations of you. And he, when he comes back, is going to do an accounting of my life and of yours. When I look at the irresponsible servant, wow. Again, I don't know his motive. I don't know if he was lazy and different, just busy with his own life. But even what he had been given, what happened to that? It was taken from him. 
and given to the one who had been faithful. As for me, and I, as I really hope and I pray for you today, that when Jesus comes back, I'll be like that servant who says, the work that you had given me to do, it's been done. I gave my best. I tried the hardest. Will that be on the trophy that your Lord rewards you with? That you gave your best? That you tried your hardest? I hope it will. Would you stand? <sighs> Father, as I did in our first celebration, and I do again here, I start with a confession. And if you're a brother or sister hearing this prayer, you might want to consider this confession for yourself as well. You can do it privately. You don't just have to say it out loud as I will. But Father, I confess to you that I've not always given it my best. I've not always tried the hardest to use the gifts and the talents that you've given me to further your kingdom. More often than not, Lord, I used those things to further and build my own kingdom, to be about my own business. And I confess that to you today, Father. And it is my hope and prayer that even as some are hearing this right now, that they would be moved to make that same confession. Because I'm sure some of them know that right now. The Holy Spirit is talking to you right now and saying, hey, you're blowing it. You are not putting your best into the things of God that really matter eternally. I ask you to join me in confessing that to your Father who loves you. May you know, as I believe that he's forgiven you and he's forgiven me for not having given our best. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you that in spite of our continued wickedness, our continued giving in to sin, that you're a God of continual grace. You not only saved us in salvation, but you offer grace when we come to you and you offer forgiveness when we need it. And right now, Lord, I think many of us need it. But Lord, it is my hope that we would all leave from this place today changed. That if we've been irresponsible, we haven't taken hold of those things that you've given us to do, that that would change today. We would not walk away from this unchanged and further harden our hearts from the things that you desire for us to do. I pray, God, that you would move mightily in our midst today. That you would help us remember Realize that no matter what time we have left, whether it's a short time or an extended time, Lord, you're coming back. And you want to be able to tell every one of us, I believe, well done, good servant. I now give you authority over the cities of my kingdom. And I pray for you, brother. I pray for you, sister, that we would know now that we can enter into our Father's pleasure if we'll just simply be faithful to do the work that he's given us to do. If you're in agreement with that, would you say amen? Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.